So it seems like VC funding has been ticking back up since those bear market lows, broadly speaking. And we'll talk about Frameworks portfolio in a minute. But broadly speaking, what are VCs most excited about in terms of uh, investments in the crypto space? A big focus is tokenization. So this is kind of the bringing of real world assets on chain. You've seen BlackRock get into this. You've seen the smaller startups get into this. But this is a consistent theme for VC funds. You have gaming. And then people are just very excited about Bitcoin and ETH. Like these things have tons of ETF flows. They're really starting to scale. And we've heard that they're going to be offered to major warehouses in probably the next two or three months. So that'll be a second wave of these flows. And we'll definitely talk about those ETF flows in just a minute. But with respect to the Bitcoin ecosystem in particular, I feel like earlier this year, there was all this excitement around uh, L2 projects that were building, a lot of unprecedented deal activity happening specifically within Bitcoin. I was talking to other VCs about this. And part of that, I imagine, had to do with the momentum of runes coming after ordinals and just you know more functionality on top of the blockchain. Has that momentum uh, maintained itself? Or have you seen, is there, is there less excitement specifically in Bitcoin? You know a lot about Bitcoin to throw those product names out there. <laughs> but um, I think the momentum is sustaining. All these projects have yet to really launch. And so we'll kind of, we're kind of in like a wait and see type scenario for the next six months. But I think these projects are going to ra- ride the wave of enthusiasm and flows from TradFi into both Bitcoin and ETH. And every cycle, people say that Bitcoin is the, the thing we're going to do this cycle and nobody's going to go on any other chains and we'll stay there forever. I just don't see that being the case. The world is multi-chain. Ethereum has a dominant L2 ecosystem. And so we see more excitement on the ETH side than Bitcoin. But you know, those are kind of the two main horses for this cycle. And specifically looking at your book, you do a lot of work in financial services. You've got um, some of the DeFi protocols that you've invested in, Aave, Chainlink. Talk to me about those investments and, and also perhaps any like uh, concern you have around the regulatory uncertainty as the SEC has been coming after a lot of these DeFi platforms as of late. I mean, the bottom line with DeFi is that these are better, cheaper, faster financial services. They're available globally. And you know, most people in other countries don't have access to US dollars. They don't have access to you know, a borrow lend facility. They don't have access to the ability to swap one currency to the other. And so that's what DeFi is providing. And again, it's, it's all based on ETH at the moment. Um, most of the stable coins, most of the financial services activity. But on the regulatory side, we see this getting better, not worse. I mean, there has been some you know, lawsuits and you know, various projects are fighting the SEC in court. But I think having their day in front of a judge and being able to explain what they're doing is ultimately going to be positive for these projects. And you know, you've seen the SEC's track record in court. It's not great. You know, they, they've kind of had of as late, many- A lot of losses. Right. right. And yeah. so can they string together a series of wins? I, I'm not quite sure. Um, but these DeFi projects, they don't care about this. And not in the sense that they're breaking the law, but these DeFi protocols are just smart contracts. They're a code that executes autonomously. Um, and as long as there's one person running the Ethereum blockchain, they will work. And so that's the beauty of crypto. It doesn't matter if the regulators or you know if some other party tries to stop it. Um, as long as there's people using it and running the software, you know it's guaranteed financial access to financial services. Are you keeping an eye on how those cases go with you know Robinhood's crypto division, Uniswap? You also have Consensus that's fighting the SEC, or is that really beside the point in terms of your investment strategy and how you think about next steps in that financial services corner of your book? I mean, crypto has only ever existed in a hostile regulatory environment. Basically, from the jump, they've been trying to stop crypto, and I honestly have lost count of how many cases there are or who they're being fought by or for. But it doesn't really matter. I think what's coming down the pike is legislative clarity things like the Stablecoin Act, things like FIT21. And if we get even one of those done, it provides a legal pathway for DeFi to exist. And it kind of, you know, does away with all the court cases and even things like the Chevron Doctrine being repealed, you know, that's going to make it a lot tougher for the SEC and other regulatory bodies to really go after these DeFi protocols. But, um, you know, if there's fraud, if there's scams, if there's people doing bad things, we want those taken care of. We just want a pathway for innovation. You mentioned FIT21. That's one of the competing bills that's making its way through Congress. Last night, we heard from Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and he said that he was confident that we could get one of these bills passed into law. Now, he didn't specify which one, but uh, to to have uh, the Democratic lead kind of uh, throwing his weight behind that, certainly a lot of people enthusiastic that we might see some clarity finally from Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. It's great that it's bipartisan. A little scant on details from, from Chuck, from Senator Schumer. Um, but I think, you know, people are coming around to the idea that crypto is not dying. Uh, the government has tried to kill it at various points. It didn't work. You know, FTX happened, still didn't die. If it hasn't gone away by now, it's probably not going away in general. 
and it's time for legislative clarity. And you mentioned those spot Bitcoin and Ether ETFs that were recently approved and launched uh, just this calendar year. And that impacts your business. You have, what, $1.5 billion worth of spot crypto exposure. Talk to me more about how those ETF flows have, have rippled into your company. I mean, it is remarkable for both ETH and Bitcoin that they've become so large without access to any institutional capital. That's literally the reverse of what usually happens. And, you know, Bitcoin's a trillion, ETH is a, you know, 300 billion, 400 billion. That's all retail. And so what has happened now is the spigot for traditional uh, finance inflows has opened and, you know, what's happened, you know, the Bitcoin ETF has been one of the best ETF launches of all time. It's got about half the AUM of the gold ETF. The ETH ETF has followed hot on its heels and it's getting on some days this week more flows than the Bitcoin ETF. And so the market is bifurcated into ETH and Bitcoin. They're getting all the TradFi inflows and then the rest of the market are competing for these retail inflows that are still in crypto. And those are huge flows. On the day that EK crashed, the crypto exchanges traded more volume than the stock market. So it just gives you an idea of both how large the TradFi inflows are, but also how big the crypto endogenous market is. And it's a global market. It's accessible by far more people than are, you know, have access to the stock market. And that's just a bullish tailwind for the whole industry. So I was digging into all those 13F filings, getting my quarterly look at what, uh, you know, the banks and hedge funds have in terms of exposure to these new, or to the spot Bitcoin ETFs. Ether started trading in July, so we're not seeing that reflected in those filings just yet. But my, you know, I was actually kind of surprised. Some of the players who got in during Q1 were paring back their positions in Q2. We saw Goldman jump in to the tune of 400 or so million dollars. A lot of these banks, of course, this is a reflection of what their wealth management clients are asking for. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the hedge funds, I mean, I'm not seeing huge positions here. Are we going to see the, the dam break at some point? Are we going to start to see more blockbuster flows? And, and why do you think it is that for the most part, institutions have been relatively um, moderate in the positions that they're taking in these new spot crypto funds? So the big positions you see, and I think Millennium had almost a billion of the Bitcoin ETF yeah. in, its, in its book. Down um, from two billion in Q1, though. Down from two billion, um, but my assumption is that they're putting on what's called, you know, the carry trade. And people have seen the yen carry trade, but there is a similar thing where uh, Bitcoin in the future is more expensive than Bitcoin in present day, and so there's an arb to be had there if you can put on the trade correctly. But you do see people like the investment board of the Wisconsin State Pension that has upped their Bitcoin allocation, and like this is just the start of these flows. And I don't expect the pod shops to to put on a, a big Bitcoin long. It feels like that's a pretty good way to lose your job if you're working at this that type of place. But the high net worths that are at these large investment banks, prime brokerages, you know, those are probably going to be coming online in the next few months. Um, and then I think people are going to generally look at Bitcoin and then look at ETH and say, you know, is this the same trade? And can we just do this again? And I think more and more people are going to have a 50-50 Bitcoin and ETH allocation going forward. Hmm. I'd be remiss not to ask you before you leave uh, about all-time highs, price moves. Are you seeing Bitcoin perhaps surpassing that um, that high that we saw it reach above $73,000 in March? Or, or where do you see prices heading for the, for the two top crypto coins before the end of the year? Uh, before the end of the year, it's it's hard to know. Um, but, you know, Bitcoin is worth 5% of what gold is worth. And it's more popular with young people. It's more popular with people overseas. And the, the, the ETF has half the AUM of the gold ETF. And so, like, should it be worth 5%? Probably not. It probably should be worth 20 or 30%, but that's still multiples from here. Um, and I think ETH and Bitcoin are just assets that appeal to people who are emerging investors in the stock market. And it's going to look a lot different than what you know, the older generations, the boomers you know, want to invest in. Um, and that's going to be a trend that lasts for decades.